Now let's go to verse 26, and then we'll continue on the teaching of this transitional period, a transition of Jew to Gentile. Because remember, the Jews, they were still being ministered unto. Gentiles were being introduced to the doctrine. So it's transitional, the doctrines here. Now, verse 26 is one of those ugly verses where people doubt their salvation. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. So that verse is saying, if you willfully sin out of your own will, which everybody did, I'm sure, all of us did, after you've received the knowledge of the truth. Okay, you've heard Bible-believing truth. You've heard the truth of the gospel. You took knowledge of it. You received it, right? All right, if you sinned willfully sometime after that, out of your free will you sin, then that verse says, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. <laughs> okay, so in other words, Christ's sacrifice on the cross right here will not be available for you anymore if you sin willfully. Now, that's quite a scary thing. Now, I know what you and I are thinking. You and I are thinking, well, didn't Jesus Christ's sacrifice paid for our sins once and for all? So, if we are saved, once saved, always saved? Yes, that is true. But remember, for the Hebrews, that is not the case. The application of the blood is different. You and I are washed. See that? So, in other words, Jesus washed us. But in here, for the tribulation saints, those Jews have to wash themselves. Now, I showed you the verse on that at Revelation 7. So, we won't turn there again. But in Revelation 7, that book is about the tribulation time period. And in that tribulation time period, they're washing themselves in the blood of Jesus. But you and I, there is not one single verse in the entire Bible that shows Christians washing themselves in the blood. It's always in the passive tense that we are washed. We receive the washing. Jesus is the active agent washing us. But in the tribulation, they have to be the active agents. They have to keep actively washing themselves. See, that's active activity. That's work. That's good works. So in the tribulation, there is good works involved for their salvation here. That's why it makes a lot of sense. If this book is for tribulation Jews, it's applicable to them. So if they sin willfully, then they're not, they're failing to apply the blood of Jesus on themselves. Once they fail that, then there's going to be no sacrifice for sins available for them. Jesus Christ's sacrifice, His blood shed, won't be available for them. There won't be anything remaining. So it is very important for the tribulation saint that they have to abstain from sin. And as I mentioned before in our previous chapters in Hebrews, when they sin, they've got to keep washing themselves in the blood. See that? So as long as they keep washing themselves in the blood, they're fine. But once they fail to wash themselves in the blood, then you notice right here, they're willfully sinning then. That willful sinning is a rejection, an outright rejection of the blood of Christ. By doing that, then they're blaspheming, they're disgracing the blood of Christ. Now, I'm going to show you the more interesting, the more deep doctrine behind that, what that willful uh, sin will be, what that outright rejection of the blood of Christ, that outright blasphemy, that blaspheming against the blood of Christ will be. So let's, uh, I'll explain that part a little bit later, but let's keep reading down uh, onward. Notice verse 27, there is no doubt about hellfire, losing your salvation here but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the enemies. So notice right here in context verse 26, if you willfully sin, there's no more sacrifice of Jesus Christ available for you, but rather in verse 27, a certain, that's a surefire thing. So as for certain, you're gonna have a fearful looking forward to of what? God's judgment. 
his indignation, which is his wrath, a fiery wrath. Why that's hell fire? You obviously know that. Uh, if you go to uh, John 3.36, this is pretty obvious that uh, his wrath is hell fire. And then you see here fiery, so that's a no-brainer. Go to John 3. John chapter 3. And then verse 36, John chapter 3. And then we'll read verse 36. The Bible points out the wrath of God if you don't believe on Christ. And obviously, we know that's hell. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, heaven. But contrary to that, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So hell fire, a fiery indignation, fiery wrath. Now notice the tribulation context when we compare this to 2 Thessalonians 1. Go to 2 Thessalonians 1. The tribulation context is this. One day, Jesus Christ is going to come down on the earth when the tribulation is over. And Jesus Christ, when he comes down at the second advent, he is going to consume his enemies. So we know at Calvary, Jesus Christ ascended to heaven. His ascension. We know that doctrine in Acts chapter 1. But then Acts chapter 1 told you that likewise, as he ascended on that manner, he will descend. So that's his advent, his second advent. Now when he comes down, we're going to find out at 2 Thessalonians 1 that he's coming down for his adversaries, for his enemies. Now remember Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 told you a fiery indignation against his adversaries, against his enemies. So what that's referring to, if that's talking about the tribulation, is that during the tribulation, if you won't serve God, if you're not on Jesus' side, whose side are you with? You're at the Antichrist side, right? So when you're with the Antichrist side, you're considered to be God's adversary. When you choose to receive 666, you automatically become God's enemy, God's adversary. Being his adversary, then in this second advent, when he comes down, you're looking forward to a surefire, fiery indignation, his wrath. Now, this is shown when we go to uh, 2 Thessalonians 1. Go over there. Notice the Bible says in verse 7, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So one time, some de sometime, Jesus Christ is going to come down out of heaven on the earth, Verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So notice right here that Jesus Christ will sometime in the future come down, punish them with hell fire. Now go to Malachi 4. Malachi 4. Malachi will also point this out. The Old Testament prophets prophesied about Jesus' coming, that he will come down someday and then burn up his enemies. Go to Malachi chapter 4. Notice in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, it's talking about the sun who's coming down. Malachi 4.1, For behold, the day cometh, yes, some day will happen in the future, that shall burn as an oven. See, something's burning. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, so the sinners will be burned. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in His wings. So see right here, 
Jesus the Son is coming down. And he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And he shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. So notice when he's coming down, he's coming down in his wrath, and he's going to burn them up. Now keep your hand here, keep your hand here on Malachi 4, and I want you to go to ver Hebrews 10, back to Hebrews 10. But keep your hand at Malachi 4. There is no doubt this is filled with so much tribulation reference. This is not church age. There's no doubt about it. This cannot be Christian church age. There is too much tribulation reference here. We're going to go to verse 28. Verse 28. So remember, verse 27 said, and I'm trying to explain each and every word from the verse. That way everyone can understand. So a, verse 27 again, a sure fire, scary looking forward to of God's judgment and his fiery wrath that's going to eat up all of his enemies. All right, now verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So the author of Hebrews is showing the serious weight of God's judgment by comparing it with Moses by reminding them about Moses' law, that during Moses' law, people who despised God's instruction, they died without mercy. And they always had two or three witnesses to establish that for their penalty. Now, this is God's uh, judgment on them for ignoring Moses' law. Now, if you go back to Malachi 4, Notice when Jesus comes down, he reminds them, don't forget Moses' law. Look at Malachi 4, verse 4, the very next verse after what we read. Remember ye what? Law. The law of Moses, my servant. Why is that mentioned there? It's a tribulation reference, matching perfectly with Hebrews. There's no doubt the book of Hebrews is tribulation. Amen. That's not Christians or Christian Jews in the first century, like a lot of theologians will try to tell you. This is more than that. This is beyond that. This is tribulation doctrine for Jews. There is no doubt about that. Now we're going to compare this with Deuteronomy, 30, uh, Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Notice that in the law of Moses that if you had two witnesses that can establish a crime that you committed, the Bible says that you are to be put to death. All right, Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. So the author of Hebrews is trying to remind them of an Old Testament law that two witnesses if they were to saw you commit the sin, then you would die. You would be put to death. So he's warning them, don't forget that rule. Because in the tribulation, the Lord's going to make sure that he's going to put you to death. And his death penalty is hell fire if you're not careful. So Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6. At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. So notice right here that uh, if there are two or three witnesses that can establish the crime you commit, then you will die. Now let me show you the interesting deep doctrine here. All right? I want you to go to Matthew 18 now. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, and then I want you to go to James 5, James 5, Matthew 18, and then go to James 5. I'm going to show you something extremely interesting here. It's going to get a little deep, but I'll try to break it down as best as I could, okay? Now in Matthew, Jesus Christ is speaking to Peter, right? Now he's telling him about the regulations of the church here. Now, the regulations of the church, let's put church here. 
Uh, okay. All right. Church. Now, when we think church, we think Christian, right? So that's pretty much common sense. But we have to realize church means called out assembly. Okay? So in other words, because it's an assembly, the Old Testament had an assembly, didn't they? Uh, Acts chapter 7 told you the church that is in the wilderness, which is those Jews who are wandering in the wilderness 40 years. Why? They had no Christian church that time. So church meant called out assembly. If you look at Acts 19, another example, there were pagans who had temples, but the King James Bible translation called it robbers of churches. So those churches weren't obviously Christian churches, those were pagans. So church means a called out assembly, there's no doubt about it. In Revelation 2 and 3, we see so much doctrine about tribulation there. But God, but God says churches. He's addressing to churches. But obviously there's no Christian church in the tribulation. We're raptured up to heaven. So we must understand when the word church is mentioned, it simply means assembly or called out assembly. So when we say church, it can refer to Christian or it can refer to tribulation. So when God says the word church, we have to keep in mind two possible audiences. He could be speaking to either or, or even both when he says church, okay? So we have to understand that. So here is the tribulation saint. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. How's this? Is the S cut off here? The S is barely in there. All right, we'll just put the barely in there. There. Okay. All right, so the tribulation saint, and then we see right here the Christian. Now, we see the distinction. This is one who's actively have to wash himself in the blood. And it's mentioned right here, he has to wash himself. But then over here, the Christian is washed by the blood of Christ. Now, both of them can be called church here, because church means called out assembly. Now, Jesus gives regulations about the church to Peter, okay? Now, the Christian and the tribulation saint then can learn regulations here. All right, so I'm gonna teach you about church discipline here. So this works for the Christian church as well as the tribulation church. So let's look at this, okay? Check this out. All right, Matthew 16 first, all right? Now this is what the Catholic Church uses to teach that um, the Roman Catholic Church has the power to bind you of your sins and to forgive you of your sins. So then you have to confess your sins to a priest. But that's very, um, they mislabeled it. When they say church, they're making you think only church leaders. See that? That's very mislabeled. When church is mentioned, that means the people in there make up the church. So in other words, you and I are the church. So we're not confessing sins to a priest or a church leader. The entire people make up the church. So we have the power to forgive the sin or to leave them bound in their sin. We have the power to do that. You might say, why is that? So let's look at Matthew 16. It's called the power of binding and loosing. So the power of binding and loosing is very mislabeled. It's very much misunderstood thanks to the Roman Catholic system. We have to understand that it's more simple than you think. The power of binding and loosing is as follows. We're gonna look at the verses, but the whole bottom line is this. If someone in the church commits a wrongdoing, then what you do is step by step, you go to that brother and sister first privately, 
okay? And then you tell the brother and sister, I'm sorry for the wrongdoing that I committed against you. And then that brother and sister in Christ forgives, forgives him or her, all right? That's how you do it. Now, if the, the person fails to do that, then the person who's been wronged has to grab another witness. Now, ideally, it should be the pastor then, all right? That way the pastor can, uh, that's why you need two witnesses. Why? Keep the problem small, all right? Usually if you grab another brother or sister, it turns into gossip. It doesn't keep it there, see? So you should get the one who's basically in charge. That would be the wiser method. So two witnesses or three witnesses, see that? Now you get two or three witnesses whose word is established to determine the judgment. Now, if the person fails to reconcile with two or three witnesses, the person refuses to apologize, refuses to recognize the wrongdoing, then you need to bring it in front of the whole church. So then what happens is then the whole church gets involved and it becomes a matter where the person refuses to repent, to reconcile. Then what they call is you church him or her. In other words, you kick them out of the church. So that's how discipline procedures work in a Christian church. So then the person is bound in his or her sin. See that? Why? Because the person refused to receive the forgiveness. So because they refuse to receive the forgiveness, they are bound in their sin. Once they're bound in their sin, they're in problemo land right here. They got a huge problem. Because what can happen right here is that you, basically when the person is kicked out of the church, they are basically surrendered to Satan, believe it or not. So that's the power of binding and loosing. The power of loosing sins is the forgiveness. Binding is where you, where you don't receive the forgiveness. So then the, the devil, he has freedom to do what he wants with you. So that's pretty scary right there. Now, if that person is a saved Christian, okay, and then he gets kicked out of the church, this is not to mean that you lose your soul in hell. But what's going to happen is your body, your flesh is turned over to the devil. So the devil can do whatever he wants with your body. Now, if you've seen Job, Job is a safe person, but you've seen what the devil did to his body. All right, ain't pretty. Devil may not possess your soul, but he can sure possess your body. Why? Because your body still sins. Your soul, once saved, always saved. But your body, nah. -uh. When you sin, you pay the price for it yeah. in your body. So the devil can do whatever he wants with it if you're not careful. Now, people might ask, well, what if, uh, you know, the person sought for forgiveness, but then the Christian doesn't do his or her job to forgive the, wrong, the person who committed the wrong? Well, then that person's in trouble. See, because Christ will forgive the person, right? As long as you receive forgiveness from Jesus Christ, you're forgiven, right? So that's the whole bottom line. If Jesus Christ forgave you, forgives you, then you're forgiven. If you commit the wrongdoing against the brother and sister in Christ, you should receive forgiveness from him or her as well, because they have to forgive you uh, as Christ forgave you, as the verse said, right? But if that person doesn't forgive you, that's on them. Jesus Christ forgives the person. All right. But if you don't receive the forgiveness of Christ, what happens with you with your sin? Yeah. See that you're bound in it. Mm -hmm. That's right. So then you're in trouble. Then the devil can do whatever you, he wants with you with that sin. Yeah. For, for, let's give an example about bitterness. If that's not forgiven, you let that thing simmer and sit in your heart. You don't think the devil's, uh, and that remains bound in you. You don't think the devil can't play with that? Yeah, scary stuff. See, people don't take power of binding and loosing seriously. That is really scary stuff here. A lot of you don't know it, but some of you are probably bound. Why? You didn't seek that forgiveness option. Yeah, all right, serious stuff here. All right, so let's go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So see, context here is church. Jesus gives Peter the keys. What are these keys? Power, binding, and loosing. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 
But that's not just to Peter. That's to the whole church. Go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. It's not just to Peter. It's all of Jesus' disciples. The context is the church again. All right. Go to Matthew 18. Notice in verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If uh, he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, Then the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. See, that's following Deuteronomy. That's following Hebrews, this system, this church discipline system. And if he shall neglect to hear them, see that? If you refuse to reconcile one on one, then do it with two or three witnesses. And if you refuse to reconcile, seek forgiveness after that, then you have to bring it to the public, to the church. Verse 17, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a what? He the man and a publican. So you treat them like a lost person. Right. It's pretty serious there. Verse uh, 18, Verily I un say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. See that? That's to all of the disciples there. And that is at a church context. That's not specifically to, to just Peter or some religious priest or leader. Now, compare that with Second Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5 now. 1 Corinthians 5. Notice that Paul, he does the action of Matthew 18, where he treats one as a heathen man and a publican. He kicks somebody out of the church. When he kicks somebody out of the church, he delivers that person to Satan. But the spirit is saved. That person is still a saved Christian. But their flesh is destroyed by him, the devil. All right, go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. There's someone in the church who messes up at verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as not so much as named among the Gentiles. All right, someone is committing fornication, incest in the church. So that's serious. So verse 2, Paul is rebuking the church for not doing church discipline like Matthew 18 told them to do. Verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. That matches with Matthew 18. The church must take away that person. Treat them as a heathen man and a publican. So look what Paul does at verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, see that church thing, right? Church means gathering, assembling. Yeah. See that? And my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, they have the power. Why? Jesus gave them that power. Matthew 18, whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The power of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 5, to deliver, verse 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan. But notice right here that this saved Christian doesn't lose his soul, all right? It's his flesh that's delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. See that? His spirit is still saved, mm -hmm. but his body is delivered to Satan. Right. All right, that's an interesting thing a lot of people uh, didn't tell you about. So let's talk about the Christian here. The Christian, if he receives a church discipline, he messes up and God judges him, then what happens is out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, see that? Two or three witnesses, they judge that person, kick that person out of the church, and that person's body is delivered to Satan because the sin is retained. He didn't receive the forgiveness of Christ. So it is very important that that individual receives the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So you have to forgive that brother and sister. And if you don't, then your sin is retained right there because of that bitterness, right? That hasn't received forgiveness. You're in trouble, all right? So that's the reason why that uh, this power of binding and loosing is serious stuff. Christians shouldn't mess around with that one, all right? Now, but this is Hebrews, right? So when Hebrews is doing this, think about this. 
we're raptured up to heaven. If you're a tribulation saint and you've seen how church discipline goes, they're going to repeat that pattern. See that? So they know that pattern. So they follow Matthew 18, 101. Hey, brother, you did something wrong against me. Let's talk it out. You reconcile, you receive forgiveness, all right? You forgive the person or either or, all right? But person refuses to reconcile. So then you have to grab two or three witnesses. Keep it small. You don't want it messy. So get the pastor or the one who's responsible. You want to make that problem small. So two, three witnesses. Then you talk it out with that brother who did the wrongdoing. Person re still refuses to reconcile, then you'll have to bring it to the public, to the church. And the church tells that person who commit the wrongdoing, you get kicked out of the church. So then that person gets kicked out of the church. All right. In the church age, you kick someone out, they're still saved. But in the tribulation, when you get kicked out of the tribulation church, out of the saints, you get, then where, where you end up in? You end up with the Antichrist there. See that? So that's why you lose your salvation. That's serious stuff. That's why Hebrews 10 pointed out two or three witnesses. See that? When you go back to Hebrews 10, 27, or Hebrews 10, 28, Hebrews 10, 28, the author is telling you about church discipline here. See that? So he's pointing out that there's a person who messes up in the tribulation. So if they sin, see that? That's why it says willfully, right? Yeah. So this person is so willful, so proud. No, I don't care what you guys do in the church here, in the tribulation. I refuse to follow along with what you guys do. Then what he's doing, he is deliberately rejecting how the tribulation saints are going by their salvation. And he's siding with the Antichrist then. See that? So he's willful about it. He's deliberately making that choice. So then the tribulation saint has to treat him as a truly a lost person, a heathen man and a publican. So now this guy who gets kicked out of the church in the tribulation conjoins himself with the Antichrist world now. Because now, if you're not part of the tribulation church, whose side are you on then? Yeah, yeah then you're on the Antichrist side. So then he ends up with the Antichrist world system. Hence... Two or three witnesses, their word got established. And then they did church discipline on this guy. The guy gets discipline. And then when he joins with the Antichrist system, his soul hangs on the balance and God's wrath is on him. Now compare this with James 5. All right. Now remember James 5. What is the book of James about? Tribulation Jews. James 1.1, 1, 1, James 5.3, right? So I don't have to repeat that again. But the book of James is about tribulation Jews. Look how it shows church discipline here. Church reconciliation. Church uh, binding and loosing. Go to James 5. Look at verse 14. Verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. See that context of the church here. Church setting. Now look at verse 15. This is interesting. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. And what? If he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Look at here. There's a church in the tribulation involved forgiving this particular individual of his or her sins. But look at verse 16. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that ye may be healed. Now look at uh, verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Notice right here that the church is involved with forgiving the individual of his or her sins, but also getting them back into salvation right. because that person is messing up in the church and stepping out of his or her salvation. So the church's job is to save them from that, save the person from that. So notice this is all beautifully matching up here together. This is all beautifully matching up about tribulation doctrine of how they enact church discipline. So that's what you saw. We also learned about the Christian church age discipline as well. 
So you saw two, doct uh, two things going on here. Okay, go back to Hebrews 10. So that was one deep doctrine. We got a lot more, all right? The, tonight's teaching is going to be good, all right? So we're going to go to Hebrews 10 and then verse 29. The Bible says, Of how much sore punishment, suppose he, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. Okay, uh, I'm going to explain each and every word here. So the author is saying, How much sore, how much more severe will the punishment be? will be, suppose it. So when he says suppose he, he's asking everyone in the audience to suppose, to think about it. How much more severe the punishment will be for the particular individual who thought, who, who is very deserving of it, that's thought worthy, that's the idea. How much will you think the person will be more deserving of the punishment who Trods, see right here, the blood of Jesus Christ. He treads it, he trods it underfoot. Why? Because he, look at that, sinned willfully. He just outrightly rejected it. Now remember, the tribulation saint, whenever he or she sins, as long as he or she constantly washes himself or herself, then he or she is fine. But when the person, see, when you're trotting underfoot, See, that's rejecting it. That's outright blaspheming against it. So then what is that? That is an acknowledge. If this is tribulation doctrine, it makes sense. That's acknowledging the Antichrist then, right here. Now that's the more specific sin that I'm going to point out to you. It has to do with taking the mark of the beast. So that's what it is. But I'll explain that a little bit more, all right? But let's concentrate on this part. The idea is the person willfully sins, outrightly rejects the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, trods it underfoot. When you're trotting Jesus Christ's blood underfoot, you're not willfully receiving it. See that? You're willfully rejecting it. You're willfully stamping it out. So then uh, he underfoot, he's trotting the blood of Jesus Christ trotting underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. Oh, so notice right here, this individual who counted the blood of the covenant, that's Jesus Christ's blood, who made that new covenant. Now remember, that new covenant is applicable for tribulation Jews, right? Because he's going to restore the nation of Israel. So he counts that blood, in that blood where he was sanctified, where he was made holy, see that? So he was saved. This is a person who was already saved under the blood of Christ. But he now counts it as an unholy thing. How do you do that? There's no way you can count the blood of Jesus Christ unholy unless you've been blinded by the Antichrist and think that those tribulation Jews with their blood of Jesus Christ is unholy that they're the bad guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. See that there? That's why it makes a lot of sense when you go back to Matthew 24. Keep your hand here, Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is about the tribulation, right? Notice the verse here says that if it were possible, the Antichrist can deceive the elect. So the, the, uh, the deception is so strong that the Antichrist, if it were possible, could deceive the Jewish tribulation saints. That's pretty serious there. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Remember, the Antichrist is declaring himself to be Christ at verse 23, right? Matthew 24, 23. So here's the Antichrist. He says, no, I'm Jesus Christ. But those tribulation Jews, they're the evildoers. They're the Khazars. They're the fake Jews. They're the ones... Uh, you know, the evil elites who ruled over the world. See that kind of stuff? So the Antichrist can use strong deception like that. And then those guys who are once siding with the tribulation saints, they get deceived by the Antichrist thinking he's Jesus Christ, and then they could get deceived by him if they're not careful. Because the Antichrist declares himself to be Christ, but also, notice right here in verse 24, it's so deceptive for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. 
How about that? All right, go back to Hebrews. Hebrews. Now, notice that they count it as an unholy thing, the blood of Jesus Christ. They outright reject him. So that's sin willfully there. And have done despite unto the spirit of grace. So their actions that they've committed is contrary. All right. That's what despite is. Contradicting or out of spite to the Holy Spirit that gives the grace. So notice right here, if there's an outright sin that willfully rejects the blood of Jesus Christ that you would stamp it out, this is such a blasphemous act that you would count it as an unholy thing. Notice this blasphemous act is also committed against the Holy Ghost. Can some of you guess what the sin is then? That's the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Notice right here, so then the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is committed during the timeline of the tribulation. Now, this blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, you can guess what it is then. This blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, if it's an outright, think about it, use your head now. If it's an outright rejection of the blood of Jesus Christ, where you count it as unholy, and then you end up siding with the Antichrist, what are you doing then? You're taking the mark of the beast. That's what it ends up in. Now, I'm going to show you uh, three verses, in, uh, two verses in Revelation that point out that those who receive the mark of the beast or those who side with the Antichrist, they are bla they're joining the blasphemy against God. All right. So let me show you two passages. Go to Revelation 13 and uh, Revelation 16. Revelation 13, Revelation 16. I think my brain is functioning fine so far, right? <laughs> Unless I am really wacko, then what you're hearing is wacko stuff right now. No. But it sounded good, didn't it? It sounded pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> Revelation 13. Revelation 13. And then we'll go to Revelation 16. Revelation 13 and Revelation 16. That book is very interesting, isn't it? That book will blow up your mind every single time. One thing I learned is Bible study is never boring. If you think that Bible study is boring to you, there's either something wrong with you or the church you're attending, all right? Could be both. <laughs> Revelation chapter 13. And then we'll look at verse 4. Now look at this, verse 4. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast. So this is worshiping the Antichrist. When you worship the Antichrist, do you realize who you're worshiping here? One who is blaspheming against God. Why would you worship someone who's blaspheming against God unless you're joining his side to blaspheme against God? See that? Well, let's keep reading, okay? So they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things, and what? Blasphemies. blasphemies. So here you are listening to him speaking blasphemy, and you worship him? See that? What are you doing? You're joining him in blaspheming against God. Yep. Now, uh, look at verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against who? God. Against God. To blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Okay. Now let's go to Revelation 16. Revelation 16. Notice those who have the mark of the beast blaspheme against God too. Go to Revelation 16. Go to verse 2, Revelation 16, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Okay, here are those who worship the beast and receive his mark. Notice what they do. Notice that they blaspheme against God in verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. How about that? All right, now go to uh, 
Mark 3. And Matthew 12. Go to Matthew 12. And then go to Mark 3. Hence, here's your blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. See? So they joined the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost because remember, Hebrews 10 showed you that an outright uh, blaspheming or an outright blasphemous act against the blood of Jesus Christ is also the same against the Holy Spirit. So you're blaspheming against the Holy Spirit here. Notice that Jesus Christ is in line here. If they're trotting underfoot Jesus Christ's blood, they're also accusing Jesus Christ himself. Now look at right here, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Now here's the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. A lot of people worry about, oh man, I committed this unpardonable sin. But no, this cannot be committed by you and I today. This is only committed by people where Jesus Christ is present. Now, Jesus Christ isn't present right now. So look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the what? World, world to come. Notice future tribulation, millennial reference here. Future reference. So this sin can be committed sometime in the future. Jesus said in this world and in the world to come. Why? Because Jesus was present then at Matthew 12. So that's why they could commit the sin. And in the future, Jesus Christ is coming down. Now, when you're joining the side of the Antichrist, you know what you're doing? You know he's coming down. And you join his army to fight against the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That right there is your allegiance to the Antichrist and an acknowledgement that I deliberately blaspheme against Jesus Christ. That's what it is. Now go to Mark 3. Mark 3 told you that. That you need to say it to Jesus face to face. That's the idea. All right. Mark chapter 3. Uh, excuse me. It's not Mark chapter 3. I believe it was Mark 1 or Mark 2. Let me go to, uh, let's see. I believe it's Mark. Excuse me. Oh, 3. It was 3. Thank you, brother. All right. Mark chapter 3 and verse 28. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemy wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal da damnation, because they said what? He hath an unclean spirit. See, deliberately Jesus Christ face to face, you are, uh, deem uh, you are Satan, you are unclean, you have a devil. If you think the Antichrist is Jesus Christ and you join his army and you know that the real Jesus Christ is coming down with his army, what do you consider him to be then if not Jesus? An unclean spirit? Satan? An evil being? That's blasphemy. See that? So that makes a lot of sense for tribulation. Hebrews 10 what did it say? You counted the blood of Christ as a what? Unholy thing. Right? Mark 3, 28 said that they accused Jesus for having an unclean or unholy spirit. Yeah. See that? So there's no doubt right here, this is more of a, this makes a lot of sense. This is some kind of tribulation reference here. This is some kind of tribulation reference where they, outright blaspheme against Jesus Christ and consider him unholy, unclean, because their worship of the Antichrist, they think that he's holy, that he's clean. That deception is so strong and so wicked. It's so bad, so bad. And that's crazy stuff, right? So that's why this is not to a Christian saint. You might say why that is not to a Christian saint. Because right here, uh, you see right here that in verse 26 through 30, this is all tribulation reference we found out. All right? 
Hebrews chapter 1 also showed you that, that that's a tribulation reference right there. This is all tribulation reference right here. And we've seen that when they enact church discipline here in Hebrews 10, it's very different from 1 Corinthians 5, the church discipline there. 1 Corinthians 5, the person is still saved, even though the body is delivered to Satan. But in Hebrews chapter 10 right here, this shows that you're out of your salvation. And the easy answer is because that person is joining the side of the Antichrist. It's pretty plain there. All right. Now uh, let's go to verse 30. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30. Now notice how this is all matching up with Jewish law or Mosaic law here again. Hebrews 10.30. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. So uh, notice that the writer here, he is quoting two verses. He's saying that we know him, that's God, who did say before that vengeance belongs to me. I am the one who avenges. I will be the one who will repay. I will be the one to receive payment. God said that. And another verse, the Lord's going to judge his people. Now, this verse should point out that this is clearly Paul writing. Because notice right here the language, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. That matches well with Romans 11. Yeah. Romans 11. So it shows, again, Paul is the one who seems like the obvious writer. Go to Romans 12, excuse me, Romans 12. Romans 12. Notice uh, in verse 19, Romans 12, 19, Paul writes here about vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So Paul is quoting that. Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So Paul is a writer. Now we want to know what two verses is Paul quoting from in Hebrews 10.30, right? Paul is quoting from Old Testament scripture. We want to know what they are. They are Deuteronomy 32. Go to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. Now, I'm going to show you the strong tribulation connection again. There is no doubt this is Jewish. This is tribulation. This is not Christian here. Go to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now look at verse 35, verse 35. This is the passage Paul is quoting here. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35. He says the Lord shall judge his people and that uh, vengeance and recompense belongs to him. Yeah. Deuteronomy 32, 35. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. See that? Yeah. Look at verse 36. For the Lord shall judge his people. Okay, very plain. Those are the two verses Paul is quoting from. Now look at the crazy stuff here, all right? Notice how this perfectly matches with Hebrews 10 when you look at verse 22. God's fiery indignation against his enemies. Verse 22, for a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. That was for Jews. Remember what God said, the fire will devour in Hebrews 10? Well, look at verse 24. They shall burn with, uh, they shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat. Well, look at verse 27. Verse 27. Remember Hebrews 10, the author wrote about adversaries getting burned by God's wrath. He's getting that from Deuteronomy 32. Look at verse 27. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries. See that? So there's no doubt, hands down, there is no doubt, the author of Hebrews, which is Paul, is writing from Deuteronomy 32, cl plain as day. Now, what does he call this? This is so interesting. This is all known as the Song of Moses when you look at verse 44. Look at verse 44. This is all called the Song of Moses. Look at verse 44. And Moses came and spake, unto, spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people. Now, if that is a song, 
Picture this. You know what kind of hymns the tribulation saints will be singing? They're going to be singing Deuteronomy 32. Yeah. They're going to sing Song of Moses. Yeah. You talk about motivating people on their salvation when they sing the hymn. You know, God's wrath will fall upon you, so do not sin willfully. Never side with the Antichrist. Amen. Glory to God. Run the bases. Toss a hymn book. Wow. You know, that's the kind of songs they'll be singing. The Song of Moses. Now, if you want evidence, go to Revelation 15. Here are saints who came out of the tribulation and they're singing, guess what song? Yeah. Song of Moses. Go to Revelation 15. Revelation 15. Go to Revelation chapter 15. Notice in verse 2, verse 2, they get victory over the mark of the beast. See that? Verse 2, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, and stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sing the what? Song, Song of Moses. You know what they're doing? They're singing the Song of Moses. As they're singing the Song of Moses, they have to prevent themselves from trotting Underfoot, willfully rejecting, blaspheming against Jesus Christ. They've got to instead war against the Antichrist and they have to keep singing the song of Moses. And that shows they got victory against the mark of the beast. When they sing the song of Moses, that shows they got victory over against the mark of the beast because they're singing. What are they singing? They're singing Deuteronomy 32. Remember the fiery judgment of God. Don't burn for it. All right? Make sure you don't sin willfully. That matches with Hebrews chapter 10 perfectly. Don't commit the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. That's going to probably be their favorite hymn <laughs> during the tribulation. That's going to probably be their favorite hymn because their salvation is very dependent upon it. So that's what Hebrews 10 is referring to. Would you believe it? Time is up. All right, so we'll explain this next part. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's not for you and I. That's for tribulation saints. Because Christians is the opposite concerning the hand of God. It's an opposite emotion. But we'll talk about that next time. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the people. Open our eyes more to the truth of your word, doctrine, and we've grown more in knowledge of the truth. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.